Hi folks, uh, my name's Jason, my website's jasonbirdspreacher.com I'm just making a, a, a short video, maybe 10-15 minutes uh, I just want to listen to uh, a guy called Hamza uh, He's a young guy debating uh, Chris, Christian Josh uh, who's Josh, who's a PhD student on the issue of biblical reliability and maybe if we got time, maybe go on to the Trinity but um, I'm I'm just a bit concerned. Uh, Josh is a PhD, but uh, he's a great guy, a lovely guy. But he's not as orthodox as he needs to be, um, and he needs to sharpen up a little bit. So I'm just going to play uh, Hamza and Josh, and then I'm going to come in and and give my point of view. I think I don't know, that's our job as a church. Simply on the topic of did man make God in his image? And we've spoken about briefly about ethnicity and you gave your uh, reasoning. Um, the concept of the New Testament. Um, we have how many Gospels was your canonical? Uh, so four Gospels. The four Gospels, okay. In the New Testament, how many uh, books are there? Uh, 28 or 27. 27. And um, of these, how many are Pauline letters? Testament knowledge. Oh, sorry, no, no, I don't. It's uh, about, say, 13. Okay, 13. Some of them are attributed to him. All of them are attributed to him. But there's heated debate if some of these books actually belong to him. Yes. And this is the discussion we were having last week, as in, why are there forged books within the New Testament? How then can we derive this kind of um, theology which makes up concepts such as Trinity if we know these books are forged? There are other verses, um, the end of Mark, for example, which talks about the resurrection. We knew that this was added on later. How then can we have confidence in a book which adds verses to support theologies such as the Trinity or the rise and the dying Messiah? Um, it's a big so, so, yeah, it's a big question. So, uh, Josh doesn't give a good answer. He agrees with Hamza about the last part of Mark's not in there and he talks about the there were forgeries etc um and kind of sort of like well let, let's just see what just replies but i i'll first just say that studio okay was something which was quite prevalent in that culture so there were a lot of people who were writing in this day the first but it wasn't actually accurate so when we say forge, we have obviously our, our sort of uh, thoughts on it in this culture. If you forge something, obviously it's false and those sort of things. But in that culture, it was something which was quite prevalent. So like what we were saying before, you know, about the, the marriage and stuff like that. That was something that everyone was thinking. It was a prevalent thing. You don't just look at Christian words, you look at other philosophical words where that was going on. And so the main issue was what... Oh, no, no, I'm going to give you a cheers. Thank you. Um, the main issue was, does it, does it embody a hostile teaching? And the majority of people say that it does embody a hostile teaching. So the ones that are um, obviously debated or just written by Paul, they'll still say, well, it could have easily been written by a disciple of Paul. And so it doesn't negate the problem of it being revelatory. Um, so I just want to mention a couple of things there. Um, Hamza's uh, quite a clever young lad and he's trying to uh, put doubt in people's minds there. Um, the issue concerning the last ending of Mark, modern scholarship says the last ending of Mark's not there. But a lot of people don't know how modern scholarship got to that point of view. It got to that point of view because of Westcott and Hort. And their basic argument was that we have all the manuscripts, the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, and these don't have the manuscript of the with the last ending of Mark. But the problem with that theory which modern scholarship took on is it fails to reconcile some important data. I think it's in the Vaticanus there is a, a, a gap where the writer uh, left for the last ending of Mark. So there was an awareness within those manuscripts that there was a last ending of Mark. Secondly, prior just a few years after the Sinaiticus, and, or, uh, sorry, Vaticanus, that um, we have uh, a manuscript with the last ending of Mark in, and it's only like a few years afterwards. And then thirdly, uh, most importantly, uh, the modern school goes off one family of manuscripts concerning the last ending of Mark. But good textual criticism should go off all the families. There are a number of families of manuscripts. And the last ending of Mark is in all 
the uh, other families. So there's strong evidence to say that the last ending of Mark is actually there. Uh, and then on top of that you've got quotes of early church fathers. Um, so Josh isn't doesn't has gone along with modern scholarship and he, he doesn't know this and he concedes this point to the Muslim when you don't need to concede it. Secondly, on the issue of uh, Pauline epistles, uh, Hamza says that, that some of them are forged. He doesn't give any specific arguments, although I've heard him in the past say that uh, based on linguistic studies, uh, looking at the key words and style of these so-called forged books of Paul, uh, we can attribute them as forgeries. This is a, a subjective argument. We can provide scholars who are just as eminent, who have done linguistic studies and said that the Pauline epistles, all of them, are Pauline. So, for example, uh, Etta Linneman, who was a great Boltman scholar, who uh, abandoned Boltman's scholarship and became an evangelical Christian, wrote a book showing statistically a statistical analysis of the Greek words of all the Pauline epistles show that they are all written by the same author. So the, the issue of Mark, I do agree with you, um, there are issues of Mark that the early manuscripts don't have that had exception of Mark. So I've dealt with that. Josh concedes a problem when he doesn't have to concede it. Um, so what was the question? Because, Sorry, I just, yeah, yeah, how can we trust issue? in a theology yeah. such as because Trinity yes. when we can't we trust who wrote those and books and it's in the Bible? Like the whole ending of Mark which talks about the, the, the rising this of Jesus. And we now notice here that Hamza is asking the questions. Josh is answering them. It, Josh needs to, you know, we need to ask the Muslim questions. Uh, we need to ask Hamza, how do we know that the Quran um, was dictated to to Muhammad? We need to ask about the manuscripts there. We need to ask difficult questions, but Josh is not doing that. He's just uh, receiving the questions and, and answering. And sometimes he's doing a good job, but sometimes he's conceding issues and creating doubt in Christian minds. And he needs to be careful. No, because the, the other Gospels, Matthew and Luke, are synoptic, which are seen as sisters, and they take a large volume of work from Mark. Um, so, so my question is, how then can we trust our theology of Trinity? Okay, so, okay, so firstly, Trinity, we can say, um, is something which... Just to say, even Bart Ehrman acknowledges there is independent uh, material uh, within each of the Gospels. Uh, so yeah, the synoptics, there was material... Uh, probably borrowed um, off uh, one source but yet there is uh, an abundance of independent material within each of the Gospels which Eva Bart Ehrman acknowledges. We don't just look to the councils when they were trying to express or summarise the Gospel witness to the person of Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit and God the Father and such. Um, they didn't take that approach of just saying we need one clear cut verse. It was what is the testimony of the whole of Scripture? What is the testimony of the whole of the New Testament? To the That's a good point by Josh. Uh, ten, 10 out of 10 for saying that. Jesus, to the person of the Spirit and the Father. And so it wasn't just that you need one clear cut verse. And I think that's what we always argue about. Well, is there one clear cut verse here? There are clear-cut verses where Jesus just spoke of as God, and then there's clear-cut verses. Sorry, just to, uh, I don't need to kind of interrupt you. This is the contention. The clear-cut verses seem to be coming from the books which are disputed. So um, this this way it gets very difficult for the Christian to substantiate the concept of Trinity. So all of the verses which we use, for example, because they are free that bear record in heaven. Oh, no, no, I, I wouldn't go to that. Yeah, no, I wouldn't go to that. That's what I'm looking See, Josh has made a mistake again. We can provide um, evidence, manuscript evidence, for that, that particular passage. So, modern scholarship and Josh are conceding the point to Muslims that we don't need to concede. I've done a video on that passage, you can go and look at it. So, we're giving ground to Muslims when we don't need to give ground. And also, Josh needs to push back and ask questions. Let's, let's move to the next topic we made since we're on this. He's allowing Hamza to control the debate.
Um, so there's four Gospels. Which one would you date as the earliest of the four Gospels? Uh, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Which one would be yeah, the earliest? Most scholars would say Mark. Mark. Um, some people do argue for Matthew, but the majority of scholars For yourself, Mark. since we're talking. I'll, I'll say Mark. Mark, would you know the dating roughly of that? Um, so like the 60s. 60s, so no problem. I'll go with you. Like okay. So Mark in the 60s, what would be the next one? Uh, Matthew, uh, Luke. Off the top of my head. I think it must be Matthew. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Much, but that'll be more late in the 60s, yeah. going into the early 70s. But it's yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then, uh, so it's Mark, Matthew, then Luke. Yes. And what would I say Luke is around the same time. But we are scholars do debate. So is you're it saying it's more around 60s? It's around the 60s, late 70s, and then John is the latest. Yes. Um, where the majority would say it stems from the 70s to the 90s. 70s, so, 70s to the 90s. Mm. Okay. Which one of the four Gospels, as you can see, you said Mark, Matthew, Luke, and then John. Which one of the four, and John being the latest, do you think shows Jesus as a man? I think they well, I think they all have some elements of Jesus. Which one would you say is the lowest Christology that shows Jesus more like a man? Yeah. Lowest Christology. I, I personally also high Christology. When we die, um, the but death. if I had to quantify and say which one is the lowest, uh, maybe Mark. Maybe but we, Mark. We will need to go through the book itself. And which one would you say is the highest Christology? Oh, I.e., that, 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 that Jesus yeah. is looking more like a God. Yes, so John. John. John yes. Now, some of the scholars have made this discussion. How come you have Mark, which is the earliest gospel, and it talks of Jesus being more man like? But over time, you see that Jesus eventually, when we get to the gospel of John, he becomes, becomes almost God like. Do you see any interpretation there? So, I mean, well, some scholars would argue against that development and this is process. God so if you go to people like Richard Bolton and his work, um, God Crucified, he, he argues for there being a high Christology from life. the beginning, mm. which so you can map out in Mark, death. and then it, it there was never this developmental process. It mm. does and so... That's a good point. That's a good point. And, and, and what uh, I'm just trying to do is trying to make a black and white issue here. But there are, in, in the Gospel of Mark, yeah, for example, uh, the Lord saying that he forgives sins, God forgives sins. Um, some of the titles for God are in Mark for Jesus. Uh, so there is a, a high Christology within the Gospel of Mark, as well as uh, showing Jesus as human. So the atheists try to use this trick, and um, Hamza's trying to use the trick as well. But the whole argument falls to the ground. So, for example, you have uh, Philippians, uh, which was written before Mark, uh, and there, there's high Christology, so um, the argument that uh, high Christology developed uh, after Mark uh, just doesn't stand on its head. Um, there's also scholars like uh, Louis Hurtado who, who would argue for um, a high Christology as well, and this, there's no evolutionary process. And so it's, it's a divided issue, but we have to say then, what was the issue that people were debating about? Why is there high Christology? People like Borkham will say it's because Jesus is added into the divine identity of God. Not just in John, but it happens in Mark. And so, yeah. I've got some um, of this, uh, the Bible here. Yes. Now, when we look at the earliest gospel, Mark 9 5, Jesus is called Rabbi. In the same story, which is, comes later in Matthew, yeah. the same story in 17.4, Jesus is called Lord. So it's moved from Rabbi, which is teacher, to Lord, which is more exonerific. Uh, oh, sorry, that Can you say that again? Mark, um, I've got Mark 9 5, Jesus is called Rabbi. Yes. And then later in the same story in Matthew, is Jesus is want? then called Lord. So it shows uh, a more honorific or godly title being applied here. There's other verses as well, for example, Mark 10, 18, where Jesus says, Why do you call me good? In Mark, one, the one we say that has a lower Christology, where it makes Mark look more manly. And the later one, Matthew, says it removes this story completely. There's other stories as well. Can I just say something that 
Well, firstly, uh, when we go to that one about uh, when Jesus says, uh, why do you call me good? Number one, Jesus is not negating his goodness. Because the majority of people would say Jesus is good or was good. And so is he negating his goodness? Or is he just saying redirecting and saying, well, your approach should have been like that too. I think uh, it wasn't person. that verse, there. it was the following verse that was, why thou hast called me good, there is none who is good, except yes. for the Father yes. in heaven. But then, does he, the but then does he negate? Does he negate his goodness? No, of course. He doesn't negate his goodness. And so he's just saying you need to redirect your question because you're approaching a teacher and just saying this person is good. When he's saying actually your focus is to be on God. But that doesn't negate himself being good. Well, because people still say he's good. That's a, that's a good point by Josh. But I just want to, what, what Hans is trying to do, he's trying to say that there's a development in, in Matthew concerning from Mark to Matthew to a high Christology and uh, I just let's just uh, look at the Gospel of Mark um, right at the beginning in Mark chapter 1 verse 1 uh, let's just look at uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 1 okay so the argument that Hamza is making is that uh, there was this high Christology that developed and so Mark is, is Jesus is called Rabbi and in Matthew uh, Jesus is called Lord and so he's, he's arguing there's been kind of a development so let's just look at um, Mark chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God the Son of God now that's a divine title you know, for a Jewish person to hear that, um, they would be deep, deeply offended because that, that's giving Jesus uh, divinity status. And then if you read verse 2, as it is written in the prophet, Behold, I send a messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. The voice of the crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So here, the prophet John is to make way for the Lord. So if Jesus is coming and John the Baptist is making way for the Lord and Jesus is the one who comes, then obviously, conclusion, Jesus is the Lord. So right at the beginning, in the first chapter, there's high Christology before we even get through the Gospel of Mark. So Hamza's whole theory there is collapsed right, right within the first few verses. And then, if we if we was to look at some verses in uh, Mark chapter one verse twenty seven, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. So people uh, are struck by the authority that Jesus has. Um, Mark chapter two verse seven. Why does this fellow speak this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So people are seeing that Jesus is 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 a is is showing signs of divinity, godhood. We see in uh, Mark chapter two, verse twelve. Why does he eat with the tax collectors and sinners? There's an authority there. Don't forget the people when the the sinners were not allowed to go into the temple. You know the temple is where the presence of God is, and yet. The Lord Jesus is, is going against what people are doing in the temple, the leaders of the temple. It's showing a divine authority. We see this in Mark chapter 4, verse 4, 41. Who is then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? They're seeing some kind of divine authority, more than prophethood here. Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him what deeds of power are, are being done by his hands is not this the carpenter the son of mary the brother of james and jose and judas and simon are not his sisters here with us mark 6 2 3 so the, the seeing that he is more than a prophet here they they, they can't get the head round it mark chapter 8 verse 27 who do people say that i am and then Mark 8, 29, but who do you say that I am? Why would he ask these questions? 
You know, why would he ask these questions about who he is? And then you have uh, uh, Mark 11.28. By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? Mark 11.28. So, what we're seeing here right at the beginning as we're thinking about this, we're seeing that people are astounded by Jesus they don't say, oh, this is a, a prophet, or this is a rabbi. Uh, just just those things. They, 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 they are baffled by this person. They, they, they are confounded by him. They can't put him into categories. Yeah, they call him rabbi. Yeah, they call him a prophet. But here, they, they see that he has more than that. He has an unusual authority. He can forgive sins. Who can forgive sins but God? He can command the waves. Who, who can do that? He, he goes with tax collectors. Who can do that? Only God can do these things. Then, uh, let's look at the titles of Mark. There are a number of Christological titles. First of all, um, Jesus is called Christ, the Anointed One. In one one Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The word Christ, Christos, means Anointed One. 829 Jesus asked them but who do you say they are and Peter answered him you are the Messiah the anointed one Mark 941 Jesus whoever gives you a cup of water to drink you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward Mark 1235 Jesus how can the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David Mark 13 21 22 if anyone says to you that time Luke here is the Messiah or oh, Luke, there he is, do not believe it. False messiahs, false prophets will appear. Um, Mark 14, 61. Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Mark 15, 32. Let the Messiah, the king of Israel, come down from the cross now so that they may see and believe. So the word Messiah means anointed one. What we're doing here now is this crass kind of argument that Hamza's is making here, saying that, you know Jesus is a man and then in Mark and then it, it dovetails into divine uh, in Matthew what we've seen so far we've we've seen that the people were confounded by Jesus but what we're going to look at now and what we just looked at is we're going to get a bird's eye view of the titles of who Jesus is in Mark some of them are in reference to his manhood but some of them are in reference to his godhood and here uh, the word Messiah is highly developed and is about the anointed one. So we're doing biblical theology. We can go to Mark uh, chapter 1 verse 11. So sorry. So now we'll go to, uh, we've looked at the an word anointed. Now let's look at the Son of God. The word Son of God doesn't all the time necessarily mean divine. But, as we've seen in John 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, the Lord's baptism in Mark chapter 1 verse 11. A voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. This is divine sonship, that Christ is divine. Mark chapter 1 verse 24 um, The first exorcism What have you to do with us Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God That is in reference to uh, the divinity of Christ Mark chapter 3 verse 11 Wherever the unclean spirit saw him they fell down before him and shouted You are the Son of God the devils, the demoniacs, saw that Christ was divine. Gazarene demonic, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? At the Transfiguration, in Mark 9, verse 7, Then a cloud overshadowed them. From the cloud there came a voice, This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. In Mark 12, 6, Parable of the Wicked Talents, He had still one another, a beloved son, finally he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. 
the apocalyptic discourse, but about uh, Mark thirteen thirty two. But about the day or the hour, no one knows, neither the angel in heaven nor the son, but only the Father. That is in reference to Christ's divinity. The only person who knows the Father is the Son. That is is a reference to Christ's divinity. That is a blasphemy from a Jewish point of view. Mark 14, verse 60, 62. And the high priest stood up before them and asked him, Have you no answer? What is it that you testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated on the right hand and the power and coming of the clouds. So let's just go to Mark 14, 60. And let's just see how the Jewish rabbis uh, responded to that title which we've been looking at. Mark 14, verse 60 to 62. So what we're doing here is biblical theology. We're, we're not doing hack scholarship like these Muslims here. We're, we're looking at deep, deep theological study of what the book of Mark's all about. In Mark 14, verse 60. In Mark 14, verse 60. Let's go to Mark 14, verse 60. So get your Bible. Right, we've looked at the title, Son of God. Let's see how, how the uh, rabbis respond to this. Mark 14, verse 60. The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answered thou nothing? What is it which, which these witnesses against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him, and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need we any further witness? You have heard the blasphemy, what you... What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. So they, they are equating the title of the Son of the Most Blessed to be blasphemy. In other words, they're seeing that Jesus is saying that he has divinity, that he is God. At the crucifixion in Mark 15.39, truly this man was God's son. And then you have uh, in in the book of Mark, and we haven't even begun to exhaust the biblical theology of the titles of uh, Jesus, okay, in the book of Mark. We could go on and on and on. Son of Man. This is used only by Jesus as quoted directly or indirectly indi by the evangelist. In Mark chapter 2 verse 10 and 11. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic. I say to you stand up. Take your mat and go to your home. Mark chapter 2 27 28. Then he said to them Pharisees that the Sabbath was made for humankind. And, and, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So the, the word Son of Man seems to have divinic or divine uh, characteristics Mark 8 31 then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by elders and chief priests and scribes Mark 8 38 those who are ashamed of me and my words and this adulterous sinful generation of them the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with his only angels so these are reference to deity as in going back to the book of Daniel and that the ancient of days would come in this form of the Son of Man Mark chapter 9 verse 9 and they were coming down the mountain he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the son of man has risen from the dead now I could go on and on and on quoting you Mark 10 33 34 Mark 10 45 Mark 13 26 Mark 14 21 Mark 14 41 Mark 14 62 basically we've seen the title of Messiah we've seen the title of the son of God and now we've seen the title of son of man and the Son of Man has reference to uh, deity, but also reference to the work of the Lord, that he would die and rise again. Then another title that Jesus has is Teacher. In Mark 4.38, but he was the st in the stern of sleep in cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you care? We are perishing. Mark 5.35, he was still speaking. Some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? 
So we could go on Mark 9.17, Mark 9.38, Mark 10.17, Mark 10.20, Mark 10.35, Mark 12.14, Mark 12.19, Mark 12.32, Mark 13.1, Mark 14.14. So here is a reference that Jesus is a man because they're referring to him as teacher. Then uh, he was referred to as rabbi or rabboni, a, ca a common title for my great one. In Mark 9.5, the Peter said to Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. That's Mark 9.5, Mark 10.51, Mark 11.21, Mark 14.45, refers to Jesus as Rabbi. So there is the idea that he's a man. And then we have uh, the word prophet, that Jesus is a prophet uh, or a sportsperson for God. Mark chapter 1 verse 2, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will pray, prepare your way. Um, so that's referring to the prophet Isaiah, sorry. Uh, so, uh, we'll go for Mark 8.28. Jesus' disciples, and they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. So some people believe that the Messiah would come, he would be a prophet. And there are a few texts in the Gospel of Mark that refer to the word prophet. And that is Isaiah, uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 2 and Mark chapter 11 32. And it's interesting that Jesus never uh, claims to be a prophet but implies that he is okay so let's go to mark 6 verse 4 mark 6 verse 4 mark 6 verse 4 but Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour, but in his own country, among his own kin, and in his own house. Okay. So we've looked at the word prophet. Curious, lord, or master, or sir. Some uses of the word curious clearly refer to God. So Matthew 11.9. Uh, sorry, Mark eleven nine. Okay, Mark eleven nine. Mark eleven nine. And they that went before and they followed cried, saying, "Hosanna! Blessed is thee that cometh in the name of the Lord." So the word "curious" can mean God, and we've seen Mark twelve. Uh, 29 Mark 12 29 and Jesus answered him the first of all the commandments here are Israel the Lord our God is one Lord and then Mark 13 20 so these are not reference to Jesus but we're looking at the word Lord in Mark, in Mark that can mean God so if we go to um, Mark 13.20 Except that the Lord had shortened the days, no flesh would be saved. So the word Lord there can mean God, right? We've seen that in, in Mark. However, when it's referred to Jesus, sometimes it can mean, it can be a bit ambivalent. It can mean God. It can it can it can be referring to God or it can be referring to Jesus, right? So you've got a so for an example if you go to Mark chapter one verse three. So the word Lord can sometimes mean God or or be referring to Jesus, and it's a bit ambivalent. So if we look at uh, Mark one three. Mark one three. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make the path straight. Well, I, I, to me personally, I don't, I don't 
really you know i'm just expressing what scholars are saying but personally i don't think it's really ambivalent i think it's clear that that's in reference to christ as as god personally all right i was just expressing the opinion of uh, scholars there now if we turn to mark 16:19 mark 16:19 Mark sixteen nineteen. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen. Sorry, sorry, that's that's Luke. Mark uh, Mark sixteen verse nineteen. Mark sixteen verse nineteen. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. So there, when he says Lord, it's the, it's the title of God. Okay. Now, so, in other words, the word Kyrios, or Lord, or Master, it can mean Master as in a man. It does also mean God. And Jesus uh, has the title of God in Mark 16.19. And, um, you know, there are... So, so, let's get this right. So, the word Lord... If Mark 11.9 shows that it can, clearly can mean God, it can also mean master or owner. Jesus, it refers, scholars say it can be ambivalent in reference to God or Jesus. But I would say the scholars are wrong because if you read the context of say, uh, Mark 1.3, it's clearly in the context of Jesus. So there's even in the early Mark, chapter of Mark it's in reference to Jesus as God then you have the combined title of Lord Jesus in Mark 16 19 which shows that Jesus is God you have in um, Mark chapter 2 28 so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath well God's the Lord of the Sabbath so now the Son of Man is Lord of Sabbath shows he's God Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy has shown you. Mark chapter 5 verse 19. And I could go on and on and on. Uh, Mark 11 3, Mark 11 9, uh, Mark 12 9 11, Mark 12 29 30, Mark 12 36 37. Uh, we'll read that. David himself by the Holy Spirit declares, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put my enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how can he be his son? And the large crowd was listening to him with delight. Mark 12, 36, 37. So this is reference to divinity. Okay, so what we're seeing here, what we're seeing here is, is if we go back to Hamza, just go back here. Let's just listen again. The Mark, one, the one we said has a lower Christology where it makes Mark look more manly. And the later one, Matthew, say it removes the story completely. There are other stories as well. Can I just show something that, um, well, firstly, uh, he argues for there being a in the same story which is, comes later in Matthew, the same story in 17.4, Jesus is called Lord. So it's moved from Rabbi, which is teacher, to Lord, which is more it's honorific. Uh, oh, sorry, exactly. Can you say that again? Mark, um, I've got Mark 9 5, Jesus is called Rabbi. Yes. And then later in the same story in Matthew, Jesus is then called Lord. 
So it shows uh, a more honorific or godly title to be applied here. There's other verses as well, for example, Mark 10, 18, where Jesus says, Why do you call me good? In Mark, one, the one we say that has a lower Christology, where it makes Mark look more manly. And the later one, Matthew, say it removes this story completely. There's other stories as well. So what we're seeing in our own study of Mark, in the Christology of Mark, that things are much more, there's a much more richer Christology here. We've looked at a number of titles. Uh, we've looked at the title of Son of Man, we've looked at the title Messiah, we've looked at, we've looked at the title um, Son of God, we've looked at the title Teacher, Rabbi, Prophet, etc. And we haven't even exhausted the titles that are used in the Gospel of Mark. We have another title, Son of David. It is a royal title. Um, we see it uh, in Mark chapter 10, 46, 48. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. My, many ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David. So there's a royal title. That's in uh, Mark 12, 35 and 37 also. You can also go. You can also see it in other gospels as well, in Matthew twenty one nine, Luke nineteen thirty eight, and John twelve thirteen, at twelve thirteen. Then you have the title of King of the Jews and King of Israel. Uh, Mark fifteen two. Are you the King of the Jews? Mark fifteen nine. Do you want me to release for you the King of the Jews? Uh, Mark fifteen eighteen. And uh, they began saluted him, King of the Jews. Uh, another title about Jesus is the carpenter, the son of Mary, Mark 6.3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? Another title, Jesus of Nazareth, Mark 1.9. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, Mark 1.24. Uh, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? And then you can go Mark 10.47, Mark 14.67, Mark 16.6. So... Here we've we've had a look at a number of titles and references to Jesus: Son of Man, Son of God, um, Prophet, Rabbi, uh, Teacher, um, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, etc. Okay, many of them are, a number of them are in reference to his humanhood, but also a number of them in reference to his godhood, but all of them in reference to uh, well, well, most of them in reference to his, his, his messianic work. Now, we haven't even exhausted the Gospel of Mark. We've only looked at titles. Now let's look at the actions that Jesus performs. He performs the reign of God in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent. Believe in the good news. So the kingdom of God has come in Jesus. Mark chapter 4 verse 11. To you has been given the secrets of the kingdom of God. In Mark 4.26 the kingdom of God is if someone, as if someone would scatter seed on the ground. Mark 4.30 With what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will be used for it? Mark 9.1 Truly I tell you there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God has come with power. Mark 9, 43, 45, 47. Mark 10, 14, 15. Mark 10, 25, 25. Uh, Mark 12, 34. Mark 14, 25. Mark 14, 43. Joseph of Arimathea in Mark 15, 43. Respected member of the council who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. Went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body. So the kingdom of God in... When Jesus is mentioned, or in reference to him, it is in the reign of God, that the reign of God has come. The Lord Jesus has unusual authority. In Mark, 12, uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 21 to 27, he taught them as one having authority. In Mark 4, 39 to 41, he rebuked the wind. In Mark 3, 14, 15, he gives authority to the apostles. 
authority to cast out demons. In Mark 6-7, uh, he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. The Lord takes on human authorities. In Mark um, eleven fifteen to 19, we have the temple situation. Um, so let, let, let's look at Mark eleven fifteen. Mark eleven fifteen. Mark eleven fifteen. They come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them out and sold and brought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves so there the Lord takes authority in the temple and then we see that the Lord has human emotions um, in Mark 141 he has compassion Mark 143 strong displeasure Mark 8.12, sighing. Mark 10.14, indignation. Mark 10.21, love. Mark 14.33, distress. And then the Lord foretells the future. Mark 3.6, the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with Herodias against him how to destroy him. So the Lord like, foretold what would happen about the future. So, when we hear this Muslim apologist here, Jesus is called Rabbi. Yes. And then later in the same story in Matthew, is Jesus is want? then called Lord. So it shows uh, a more honorific or godly title it's being applied here. So There's cool. other verses as well, for example, Mark 10, 18, where Jesus says, Why do you call me good? In Mark, one, the one we say has a lower Christology, where it makes Mark look more manly. And the later one, Matthew, say it removes this story completely. There's other stories as well. So what we're seeing by our study here, that the Christology of Mark is much more richer, deeper and would take hours I've, I've only just scratched the surface but it would take hours to expound so for Hamza to, to come up with some kind of simple kind of um, statement about who Jesus is and say that it was developed over time from a simple idea that Jesus is a man to Jesus being God in Matthew um, it, it just doesn't understand the full richness just of the gospel of mark there's such a rich christology in mark and we've just looked at some of the titles yeah it's in reference to him being a man but also there are titles that uh, seem to indicate uh, that he is divine see seem to and then not only that we get this richer picture of that he is king that he is prophet that he is the anointed one that he is lord that he is the son of god that he is the son of man that he is rabbi, that he is teacher, that he is a man, that he has emotions. We're, so it, it, it's all there in the Gospel of Mark. There's a, there's a richness there. And um, so for anybody, to, um, for anybody to come up with simplistic arguments saying that Christology uh, developed over time from a simple uh, human Christology in Mark to a more complex Christology in the Gospel of John to high Christology um, just really hasn't grappled with the Gospel of Mark and looked at the richness of, of the biblical theology of that Gospel. So we'll finish there and um, so you can you can have a look at me uh, this is my file this is my file that I take down to Hyde Park and uh, so, so I hope that's a blessing to you. So basically, if you want to learn one thing is, if you're going to go down to Hyde Park, you need to go prepared. You can't just go down there and talk to people like Hamza and, and just expect uh, a, a, an easy ride. You've got to go and prepare.
you know you've got to listen to what they say and you've got to research and study and find out the answers what I've done here is just demonstrated that if you do uh, your own research your own study or read other articles or read things that will help you you'll get a much much uh, deeper understanding of the Christian faith and be able to answer Muslim objections and I hope this has given you a resource just to realize hang on when I'm listening to Muslims argue and they come up with these good arguments really they're not really giving any deep scholarship if I actually do a bit of scholarship and a bit of research I can easily debunk these Muslims so rather than accept their arguments I need to go back and uh, do some research and then come back at them alright I hope that's been a help to you and uh, God bless you take care